in this as well. So if you miss anything or you want some other information um, or you need to share with somebody, let us know. Um, we'll be posting on our social media. And then at the end, and usually I have enough time, um, we'll go into some basic pest management. Um, I usually try to make it to that because most people are very interested in pest management. So, um, and then some other general tips at the end. So some basics first of what a plant needs. Um, sunlight, water, nutrients, soil, and a proper temperature to be growing in. Um, pretty basic, but first with sun, um, all, pretty much all vegetable plants need at least six to eight hours of sunlight, really even going more up into the 10 hours of sunlight, with most of that being direct sunlight. Um, so whenever growing, definitely in a city, um, looking around for where you're growing, looking at shading, if you have lots of large trees overhead, um, trying to avoid that. Southern sun is what in Missouri we're looking for. Um, you'll get the most direct sunlight in the south with a south, southward facing raised bed or garden. Consistent watering. Um, in, we water, you should be watering pretty much every day. Um, and then when we get hot Missouri days in the summer, it's up to 9,500 degrees. You should probably water twice a day. And we'll go a little bit into that. Um, plants need nutrients. So not only within the soil, but nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the three you see the most. They're abbreviated as N, P, and K. Um, there are also a whole host of other nutrients that plants use. Um, and we'll go into a little bit of nutrient deficiency, specifically with like tomatoes and peppers. But those three are the three that you hear about the most. And whenever you're looking at fertilizers, those are the three that tell you the ratios on. So, and then soil. Now, technically, you don't have to have soil. Um, you can grow it in water, but um, soil is pretty much what we'll be talking about. And then proper temperature. Um, so growing things in the correct season, um, if they can't handle frost um, and it freezes, the plant's going to die. So pretty basics. A little bit about perennials versus annuals. Most of this presentation will cover annuals, but I do just like to make this little point. Um, annuals grow for one year um, and die. Now, technically, some annuals actually can grow for multiple years, but here in the Midwest, um, we treat them as annuals. And then perennials grow for at least two years, if not more. So fruit trees, like in this picture, they're a perennial. Um, tomatoes are an annual. Some plants, like I mentioned, are perennials in the tropics, but here we consider them annuals. Other plants, such as like kale um, and collards, they're actually biannual plants, so they could actually grow for two years. Um, they seed that second year, but if you're growing them for eating, you only grow them for one year. Yeah, a little bit more, um, depending on, and we have actually whole classes on perennials and different plants. Um, scheduled. So if you're interested in learning more about perennials or growing, um, definitely recommend taking those. Um, but depending on the plant, they usually take one to three years on average to establish. Um, and specific perennials to this region, raspberries and blueberries and blackberries do pretty well. Um, asparagus does great. And then within those herbs, chives, sage, mint does very well. Um, and lavender and occasionally rhubarb as well. All right, so this is the plant hardiness zone map that the USDA uses. Um, this is what we determine the hardiness zones of different regions in the US, um, and also then determines what the first and last frost dates are, which after that determines when you plant plants. Um, so for St. Louis, we're, St. Louis City is hardiness zone 6B, St. Louis County is 6A because the city has a little bit more concrete um, and a little urban heat island effect. Um, we're a little bit warmer, so we do actually fall into a separate classification. Um, but what this means is roughly our last frost date is April 15th in the spring, and then the potential first frost date is October 20th. Now, though those dates don't mean that April 15th, we won't have a chance of frost afterwards. It does mean that day, it's about a 10 to 15% chance that there won't be a frost, that there will be a frost after that date. Um, and obviously the longer we get, the farther you get into the spring and the summer, 
the, few, the lower the chance is. And that same percentage works in October as well. Um, so sometimes, like I think it was like three years ago, I was harvesting tomatoes around Thanksgiving. Tomatoes pretty much can't handle any frost. So we hadn't gotten a frost until like late November that year. So what this means is when how we grow here in Missouri and really in North America is we break them into plants into cool season and warm season. This makes our cool season for planting around March is when you plant most cool season plants here. And then around July or August, so right about now for your fall cool season. And then for planting for warm season, um, you plant in April and May. So after the last frost date when there's no chance for frost. Some different types, just kind of breaking up, as I was saying, we categorize things as cool season and warm season. Um, cool season vegetables here grow from early March to mid-May, and then from early to mid-August through November. Um, you can extend the season, and we'll go into some season extension techniques later in the presentation. Um, warm season vegetables basically grow in between the frost dates. Had a little bit of a power surge, just making sure I'm still connected. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, cool season vegetables, spring and fall. Um, they will grow over the summer, but most slow production will become bitter over the summer. Doesn't mean that you have to rip them out. So things like kale, collards, chard, um, where you grow them in the spring and you can grow them in the fall, we often leave them in the ground the whole year, um, just assuming that over the summer that they're not gonna be that tasty. Um, so sometimes we'll just cut them back. Um, any bad leaves, if there's a lot of pests on them, um, we'll just cut those leaves off, spray them a little bit with some different organic pesticides. And then once fall hits and it starts to cool off, they really start to bounce back. Um, you can also rip them up, rip them out if you don't have a ton of growing space. Um, once it's time to plant a summer plant, like a summer seedling or a summer plant, and then plant them again in the fall. Um, but it's less work to not do that. Um, pretty much all cool season vegetables can tolerate a little bit of frost. Um, some can handle harder frost. Um, we have a class later, um, I think in like a month and a half or so, um, that will go into like more winter gardening. Um, and so how to prep your plants um, for winter, how to mulch, different things to cover with and such as that. Um, crops such as like garlic and winter onions, um, are, and winter carrots as well. Um, you can plant these basically in the fall and then you actually harvest them in the spring and the summer the following year. So, Just a nice little list that is non-exhaustive list of cool season vegetables um, that we all grow. So like this picture on the right, that's kohlrabi. Um, if you're looking for an easy plant to grow, kohlrabi is very easy. Um, not many people feel like a lot of people haven't figured out exactly how to eat it. Um, but it does really well in coleslaws. Um, also chopping it up and kind of using it as like carrot spears or something and eating with hummus, that's usually what I do. Um, and then some lettuce growing right here. So warm, so we talked about cool season, warm season vegetables grow in the summer through the fall. Um, young, so yeah, young summer plants won't really grow well in cool weather. Um, so it doesn't really make sense to try to plant these early to get them big. Um, that's why a lot of these you, you grow, you buy seedlings like tomatoes and peppers um, so that they've already got a head start because they take a while to get to the size of a, like a seedling. So you grow them indoors and then you bring them outside to plant. Um, they're all planted, all these summer vegetable, warm season vegetables are planted after the last frost date. And if you look on a seed packet, it'll tell you that as well. They have no, toss, no frost tolerance and they will die from a light frost. So. Here's a nice little list from seasoned vegetables. So we're going to go a little bit into kind of reading a seed packet um, and planting seeds. So um, use this nice seed packet from Botanical Interests because they have lots of information on it. Not all seed packets have all this information. Um, but if you do ever look up, if you're ever wanting to get some more information on a variety of a seed or of a plant, if you just Google it, you'll get pretty much all this information on a website. Um, so, but first, so 
days to emergence, or sometimes you'll see days to germination. Um, this space, the estimated window of when you will see evidence that the plant will have successfully germinated. Um, these can range quite a bit. Um, some seeds, it only takes a couple days if they get enough water um, and the temperature is correct, like right in the soil um, for them to emerge so that you know that the seeds have germinated. Others, such as like carrots, can take up to 30 days to germinate, even with all the proper watering and proper temperatures and all that. Um, so it's good to know this, definitely with like plants like carrots, where if you plant it and like after a week, you're like, oh, it hasn't come up yet. They've probably, they're probably not, they probably didn't take, so I gotta replant. Um, it's good to wait a while um, and know that germination is wrong. So, seed depth. Now, not all um, seed packets will have this, but I do like this little diagram at the bottom um, that explains basically based on the seed size where you how deep how deep you should plant it. Um, really, should never be planting deeper than one inch into the soil, um, and the bigger the seed, the deeper you can plant it. Um, and if you just kind of think about it, um, a seed has all the energy for that plant until it reaches out and gets up to sunlight. Um, so the bigger the seed, the more energy it'll have packed in there that, that small little plant can use to get up above the soil and use the sun for sunlight. So if you plant like a little lettuce seed right here, way down here where you plant some like corn or beans, um, it's not gonna make it to the top. So plants like lettuce, we really, if you're just planting the seeds, um, you're basically almost just putting it on top of the soil and then you're watering it in. And that water will actually bring the soil, bring the seed down below soil level. Um, with first time gardeners or people that are very new to gardening, um, I find people plant seeds too deep. Um, so if you're worried about planting, uh, when you're planting, try not to like plant less deep than you think. Um, definitely if you're like making a row, you put the seeds in and then you cover it, um, you're actually adding soil back on it. So if you plant, dug that row at a depth of an inch and then you add some more soil on top, um, then it's probably deeper than what you actually intended to plant today. So, so spacing, um, some will have, and that's why I use this seed pack as an example, because it has both seed spacing and row spacing, which is nice. Um, so proper distances between the rows of plantings. Now, based on the techniques you're doing, maybe you don't exactly have rows. Um, and if you don't, then you wanna kind of figure out a number in between the seed spacing and the row spacing for your distances, um, because the row spacing is taking into account extra space for the plants. So for this cabbage, um, they're saying about three inches, but then 20 inches um, apart for the rows. So quite a bit of row spacing, but not as much between the seeds. Um, obviously, this will vary greatly depending on what you're growing. Um, small plants like lettuce, radishes, and carrots will be very close, while larger plants like broccoli, kale, cabbage, cauliflower, tomatoes um, will need a lot of space so that they don't run into each other. Um, and some of these plants, like broccoli and cauliflower, if you plant them too close, they might not even flower or give you what you want to eat if they're planted too close together. So make sure to really follow that spacing. Um, also when planting, so this one, and I, outside of botanical interest, I don't really see this on any other seed packets. It has a thinning. Um, so whenever you're planting seeds, it's best to plant more seeds than you need and then come back later with some scissors to thin them out. Um, so if you're doing, say, cabbage at three inches, it's recommended to plant at least two seeds every three inches. And then after they have come up, so about seven to 12 days for emergence, um, come back through with scissors um, and determine the proper plant spacing of the plants and come back with those scissors and plant and cut them to the correct spacing to three inches. Um, you don't want to pull them out because when you do pull them out, um, all of their roots are pretty well intertwined. So the ones that you're leaving, um, you're probably damaging their roots as well. When they're that small, um, a lot of times they can't make it. So if you take scissors, just cut them off at soil level. It's also a lot faster than pulling. Um, I find so. And there are microgreens. There are microgreens, so you can, they're good to eat. Just 
just a nice little picture of what happens when you leave things unthinned. Um, very cute little carrot wrapping around another carrot. Um, really though, if you plant your carrots too close together, you're not gonna get that much carrot to eat. Um, it'll be mostly just carrot greens, but I do like that little picture. Um, and then what's on every seed packet is days to maturity. Um, this nice one from Botanical Interest also tells you it's a cool season plant. Um, so depending on how, what the crop is, will be depending on what the, what the days to maturity actually means. Um, so with cabbage, these are days to maturity. So this is from when that seed gets planted in the ground under ideal growing conditions, how long it'll take to grow to full maturity. So 95 to 110 days. Now some plants will say days from transplanting. Um, so you'll see some seeds that'll be for tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, which are recommended for transplanting. Um, and so that means obviously from when the seed seedling you're planting in the ground outside. Um, and that's when it, that's how long it'll take to get to when it is producing the first set of fruit. Now these are all estimates. Um, they are pretty, they've gotten pretty accurate, but this all still depends on weather, nutrients, water, sunlight, and lots of other environmental factors. So um, it's good to know it. Um, and if you're planting a lot of those, you can kind of time things pretty well. Um, definitely if they're near each other because they're getting the same amount of nutrients and weather and things like that. Um, so you can, like this spring, we grew four different broccolis that all had different days to maturity um, with the goal of having them all mature at different times. So we'd have broccoli that we could eat for four or five weeks. Some of them worked pretty well, some didn't. Um, but you can do kind of techniques like that with like radishes or carrots or things like that, which is pretty fun to do. All right, so what's a direct seed versus transplant? Um, I mean, really you can direct seed pretty much any plant, but based on kind of Missouri summers um, and our springs, it's recommended that certain plants you should transplant um, and certain ones you should direct seed. So first, direct seeding also saves you money. Um, so a seed packet costs $3, um, and you get at least like 100 seeds depending on what it is versus a transplant, maybe one tomato plant will cost you $3. So if you have the option or if you're thinking about what you should do, if you can direct seed, direct seeding is much cheaper and you get a lot more plants and you get a much more variety of seeds that you can pick. Uh, so what we do at Gateway Greening is we direct seed all of our root vegetables. So in this picture, we've got some nice beets that we direct seed, um, radishes, turnips, carrots, um, and most of those, like carrots, radishes, and turnips, you pretty much can't really buy transplants. Um, and if you try to grow them yourself, whenever they're moved and they get disturbed, they won't keep growing pretty much. Beets, um, you can buy transplants of beets. Um, and some people really do it. Um, I find that as long as you follow some, like as long as you're planting and paying attention and watering them, um, they seem to germinate really well, definitely here. Um, and, you have plenty of time for them to grow to full size. So um, okra, you can grow you can grow from seed. I see seedlings for sale for okra all the time. And I think that's just so wild because okra grows so fast and the seeds are so cheap and so easy to get. Um, if you're also thinking about doing some seed saving, okra is one of the like easiest plants to save seeds from. Um, and we actually have a class like next week on seed saving. So um, squash. So summer or fall or winter squashes, you can grow from seed and you can get a lot more fun varieties with those as well from seed. Um, cucumbers as well, um, loose leaf lettuce. Um, so heads of lettuce, recommend definitely with transplanting. Um, so getting a seedling. But if you're looking at just kind of doing like a spring mix, um, loose leaf lettuce really works. Um, you can usually get, um, like if you buy those loose leaf lettuce boxes from the grocery store, you can pretty much grow that the same thing um, at home. Um, what you do is you just take a seed packet of lettuce, um, just kind of loosen the soil up with like a rake or something, and just kind of like Johnny Appleseed broadcast the seeds, um, and then just take the back of a rake, kind of just lightly cover it. If you remember like kind of going all the way back to that picture of how much soil needs to cover a lettuce seed, so very little, um, and they'll come up um, really all tight together. Those you don't need to thin. 
Um, and you can just take some scissors and just kind of cut off the top once they get as big as you want. And usually in the spring, if you do it early enough, you can get two to three cuttings off of it before it starts to get really bitter. So, and if you like bitter lettuce, you can keep eating it for until it starts to flower. So, um, sunflowers, beans, peas, those are all also during seeding. Now for transplanting, um, you can, and you can also also start these inside, but, and we have a class, we'll have a little bit of discussion at a future class about starting plants inside, but uh, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, um, basil, um, I kind of go back and forth on direct seeding versus transplanting. This year we did pretty much all transplants. Um, sweet potatoes, you, they're not really transplants, they're actually slips, but you do need those. Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and lettuce. Um, and how I kind of think of these, of what you should transplant versus, um, or really the two categories of planting from transplants is, I think of cool season crops that take a long time to get big. Um, and in Missouri, sometimes those summers, they come quick. So that's kind of the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and head lettuce. Um, all, all four of those don't really like the heat. Um, if it gets too hot too quick, and definitely at night, they'll start to go to seed. So they're bolting is what it's called. And when they do that, they turn very, cabbage not as much, but lettuce, cauliflower, and broccoli, um, they'll become really bitter and really inedible. Um, cauliflower actually gets a little bit spicy when that happens. Um, so those really, you do the head, you do the transplants of that so you can get kind of a head start and make sure you can get to a kind of a full mature plant before summer hits. Um, and then with tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers, you can always start those from seed outside, um, but really it's nice to get that head start. Tomatoes and eggplants and peppers, they take a while um, to grow, um, definitely when they're young. So getting a seedling that's been growing for um, four to six weeks beforehand is really helpful, um, definitely when you kind of want tomatoes early in the season. So, and I did notice I've been using transplant and seedling. I, those, I use those interchangeably, they mean the same thing. So this is our planting calendar for gateway greening. Um, we'll send this up out also with the presentation to everybody that signed up for the class. Um, so this is specific for the Missouri region. Um, and we base this off of all the way back at the beginning of this presentation on the different growing um, hardiness zones. But so if we're looking right now, we're in middle of August of what to plant. Um, a little bit about this, so there's a little icon that shows sow seeds directly in soil, and then there's transplant indoor seedlings. Um, so if we look like right now, we're middle of August, it's time to, you can plant beets. You can also transplant broccoli right now, coming up, um, cabbage as well. And then this kind of like sideways dash lines, this is the time that you can plant them. In. Um, so if you notice some of these, it's like carrots, um, you can still plant them now, but it was actually better to plant them in August. Um, if you are going to do some season extension, you could still plant them now. Um, you might just have to cover them or something um, for later in the season. So. I know as we had a couple people come in late, um, there is a Q and A if you want to just ask any questions. Um, I have a coworker that'll be answering them as well. So. But so a little bit specific about fall um, in Missouri is when you're growing from seed or really seedlings. Um, so like I mentioned at the very beginning, the uh, plants needing a certain amount of sunlight, pretty much with less than 10 hours of sun, direct sunlight, most of the plants that we eat will not be growing. Um, there are a couple like spinach, um, green onions that can grow with less sunlight. But um, once the day length drops below 10 hours, um, you see very little growth. Um, and so in Missouri, we hit below that um, on November, around on November 18th. Um, those are between November 18th and January 23rd, those are our Persephone days where we have less than 10 hours of sunlight. Um, and that is the limiting factor for growing plants through the winter. Um, the 93 days from today, ignore that. That's not accurate. I stole this from another presentation. And obviously I updated the date for that presentation last fall, but I did not update it for today. So, um, so what this means is how does this affect the planting times? Well, when we're growing crops in the fall, um, I usually add about 14 days to the days to maturity. Um, 
So it says six to like with this, this cabbage, 65 days. Um, also, I don't know if we noticed that the cabbage on the previous one's examples, I think was much longer. Um, whenever we're trying to grow crops in the fall that are cool season, it's best to look for ones that have shorter days to maturity because of this additional 14 days. Um, that's because we get less sunlight the farther we get into fall. Um, and so the plant is getting less sunlight to grow, so it's growing slower. It's also getting colder. Um, so even though these cool season plants love, they like it cooler than hot, they do slow down their growth when it's cooler as well. So. So yeah, a little bit also, I just threw that in there for our fall, but kind of back to the planting as well. Um, if you're doing direct seeding, um, yeah, use the planting calendar, make sure you're planting at the correct time. Um, and then specifically for planting, just like a small trowel or just your hand, um, kind of make a row, put the seeds according to the seed packet. And like I said earlier, do one to at least do two seeds. If the seed packet's kind of old, and you're kind of worried about how much, if some won't germinate, do three at least. Um, and then highly recommend always marking where you plant with popsicle sticks, pencils, just anything, a little stick. Um, and like I was saying earlier, most people that are new to planting plant the seeds a little too deep. So, so. A little bit about transplanting. So first, if you've grown your own transplants, um, you do need to harden them off before planting. Um, and that even applies really to cool season plants as well, that you, if you had started some kale or collards for this fall, it's good to harden them. You don't need to harden them as long, but hardening is really just acclimating them to the real world. Um, so if you've been growing them inside under a grow light, um, under ideal conditions where they get water every day and there's really no wind, um, then you, gotta, you should take them out. Um, and the technique for hardening is basically like I was saying in here, um, over a seven to 10 day period, um, starting with a few hours a day and then kind of as going up to at least 12 hours um, and really over and have at least one overnight period as well, um, leaving them out in sunlight. Um, if it's gonna get in the spring, if it's gonna get really cold that time, so if you're doing your tomatoes and you're really like hardening them and prepping them so you can get them in as early as you can, um, make sure to pay attention to the weather um, if it gets too cold, um, you really don't want to put them out there. Um, but this hardening will help them prevent, help prevent some shock. So if you were to just plant them directly in the ground, um, a lot of them would be very stressed, not used to sun from different angles, um, wind coming from different spots. Definitely you maybe just had one fan from one side. Um, there's just a lot of things that will shock it. So hardening them off is what you should be doing at least seven to 10 days. Um, whenever you're doing your planting, just a good tip of kind of lay your plants out for your spacing. It's really easy to overplant, definitely with like tomatoes um, for your seedlings. I do it, I pretty much do it every year as I overplant. I get just too excited for the summer seedlings. Um, and then whenever you do plant, um, tip over the seedling, don't pull it out by the stem um, and let it come out. Um, and take a look at the roots. Um, so if you also are buying transplants from a store, um, it's always, if you can while you're there, just like tip them out and look at the roots. This picture right here is a perfect picture of like a great root structure of a seedling. Um, it's starting to wrap around a little bit, but not too much. Um, I don't think I have a picture of one that is bad. I should take one for this. Um, but for one that's really bad, you'll notice like if you pull it out and it's just like all wrapped together um, and you see, and it's kind of like almost squeezed, like there's just like no soil left. Um, that means the plant's been in there for too long. doesn't mean it's like not gonna grow, but it will, even if it's been hardened, it'll have some shock being planted. Um, so if it is wrapped around the plant, um, it's good to kind of squeeze it and tease out the roots as much as you can. Um, you don't need to do it to all the roots and it probably is not great to do it to all of them um, because it's pretty stressful to be kind of pulling apart the roots of a plant. And then for planting it, dig a hole deeper than the plant. For tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, add a scoop of tomato fertilizer to the hole or whatever general fertilizer you have. Um, add a little bit of soil back into the hole to kind of get your correct height. Um, and really you wanna make sure you plant the seedling at soil level. Um, and then this perfect picture of pressing lightly around the plant. 
um, and then water the plant until you see the water pool. So. Now, tomatoes are a little bit different. Um, these ones you plant actually deeper um, than the soil level. Um, so if you ever notice on a tomato plant, so if you see right here, got some like, like white little whiskers on this tomato plant. Those are all different points where roots can come out. Um, so you wanna plant your tomato pretty deep so you can have a nice strong root system below the tomato. Um, there's two, two techniques you can do. Um, I mostly follow this A technique. This B one, um, you do actually, if you notice, you would get more roots, but it is a little bit like kind of bending a plant, so it could be kind of easy to snap it. Um, the one thing with this picture is, make sure to take it out of the pot. Also, when you're planting your other seedlings, take them out of the pot. Um, this picture doesn't do a great job of showing that. So with tomatoes, um, you wanna plant basically half of the seedling underground. Um, it's a good rule of thumb. Um, so you dig the hole pretty deep, um, and then any branches that would be underground, make sure to prune those off, just like this. Um, and prune them off kind of right next to the tomato. Um, you don't want to scalp, you don't want to actually scar the, the tomato plant, you want to make it a nice clean cut. And then put some tomato, like earlier with the peppers and eggplants, put some fertilizer into the hole before planting. So when also when you're looking to buy seeds and transplants, um, I mean, obviously high quality seeds are the best. Um, specific seedling, specific plants, um, I recommend looking for hybrid varieties. So if you see F1, that means it is a hybrid. So what a hybrid is, they basically bred one, and usually what the, well, hybrid means they bred two different varieties. When they're doing it for seeds, um, they're usually taking a plant that is um, so if it's like a cucumber that's a hybrid, which there's quite a few of them, they're taking a cucumber parent plant that is, have a lot of disease resistance, and then usually pairing it with one that all, that produces a lot. So that the offspring has a lot of disease resistance and is also producing a lot of cucumbers. Um, the one thing is with hybrid varieties is you can save the seeds, but the offspring of that hybrid are not going to be similar to the parent. Um, so the F, so to the one the cucumber you just planted, um, it's because it's only one generation. Um, so you'll get a bunch of random ones, and it's hard to tell what it is. You can save them; that's perfectly fine. Um, they just won't be exactly like the old one. So that's one back. That's one kind of problem with hybrids. Um, heirlooms are great. Um, I love growing heirloom tomatoes. Um, you can find some heirloom squashes and cucumbers as well. Um, they are more susceptible to diseases um, because the plant isn't really bred for, I mean, it's an heirloom, so it's pretty much the same type of plant um, for most, of, for its generation. So there is some more susceptibility to diseases. Um, if you're ever curious about different seed, like varieties, really just Google them. You can find a lot of really high, really good ones. Um, where I like to buy seeds from, I like high mowing seeds, uh, which I think at the end of the presentation, I have a link to. Um, it's a really great website. Um, they grow their own seeds. Um, so a lot of these other seed places that you buy from, they're not growing their own. Um, they do a lot of hybrid varieties as well. Um, and the great thing is you get free shipping after $10. So it's a nice little thing. It's pretty easy to spend 10 bucks on seeds, I find. So, and then when you're looking for transplants, look for healthy looking plants that aren't either too big or too small for the pots they're in. So like I was saying with the um, roots that are kind of wrapped around, all right, so we're going to go quickly kind of into getting the bed ready, um, kind of what we do, um, some tips on that, um, and then I want to make sure we get to the pest management as well, because I know a lot of people are very interested in that. So, um, so whenever you're getting the bed ready first in the fall, try not to leave any dead plant material in your bed. Um, so if you have any tomatoes growing or any other summer plants, make sure to pull them out. Um, Tomatoes, it's pretty much not recommended if you do composting yourself to not compost the tomato plants um, or really any plant that you have that has the disease. And so quite often, definitely in Missouri, um, our tomatoes, cucumbers, and squashes all get some type of disease at some point. Um, so if you are gonna compost those, um, just be prepared that maybe the compost you're producing, um, unless you get a really high enough temperature, might have some of that disease in it when you're using it the next spring. Um, 
you can use it, you can put those in specifically in St. Louis in the yard waste bins. Um, they will basically, they cook the compost enough to where it will turn into, it'll kill anything in it. So don't worry about it. You can do that. I know I've heard some people say not to even put the tomatoes there. So for most springs, it's good to work in some compost, about an in, one to two inch layer. Um, you can turn it, so you can do a full kind of tillage of the soil, which is kind of what this picture is showing. Um, you can also do, um, and what we've really been doing is kind of step, getting away from the full like tillage of soil and turning it all the way over. Um, so instead using a digging fork, um, so that really just looks like a fork. Um, and before you put the compost on, kind of going backwards with the fork, you just kind of stand on it um, until it kind of, it goes pretty deep into the soil pull it back and forth, and then take another step back and do the same thing. Um, so you'll kind of, you'll loosen up the soil, you'll have some kind of gaps in there, and then right after that, take about, and then add compost to it. So add about a one to two inch layer. And then you don't have to turn it, you just kind of rake it. Um, and ideally you do this about at least a day or two before you're planting, because that'll give enough time for that kind of compost to fully fall into the soil. Um, the one risk is if you do that, and then you plant right after. Um, where you're planting some of those seeds, um, compost is a lot lighter, um, so it could be at the correct depth when you plant, but then after a day that seed's fallen too far in, and then it's not gonna germinate. So not the end of the world, but um, that's kind of the ideal is giving it a day or two. So if you are growing in the ground in St. Louis City and in parts of St. Louis County, um, and what I mean in the ground, in the ground, so not raised beds, you didn't bring soil and you're growing in the ground, um, I would recommend getting a soil test. There's quite a bit of lead contamination in this region. Um, now, lead uptake in a lot of plants is pretty low, um, which is great, but it also really the challenge, like the dangerous thing with growing plants in contaminated soil is you interacting with the soil yourself. So when you're pulling that carrot out of the ground, there's gonna be a lot less lead in that carrot, but all the soil on that carrot that you're getting in your hands and all that, that's where the danger is. So just get a soil test. Um, uh, there's tons of research on showing when you're growing in raised beds on contaminated soil, they're usually, you should be fine. Now there's some very high end levels of like, if the place was really contaminated, you should be growing there. Uh, but yeah, if you're ever wondering, it's good to get a soil test. Missouri Extension um, does some pretty low cost soil tests for this region, for all of the state of Missouri. So a little bit about kind of planting techniques. We're gonna kind of go into layouts of the bed real quick. Um, in the spring, um, if you're kind of, if you have one raised bed, and that's kind of what this big square is at the bottom, um, and you're looking at, you're gonna be growing maybe some tomatoes, maybe some okra in the summer, but you're gonna be growing some cool season plants in the spring. Um, you think about, you want to first think about where you're going to put stuff, but um, think about putting those cool season plants on the south side of the bed in the spring and those warm season plants kind of on the north side. I like to think of it kind of like two thirds of the way. Um, so we'll leave some space over here for the fall. Um, definitely if it's like tomatoes or okra. Um, this allows these spring plants to get enough sunlight um, in the spring because that's their limiting factor. Um, but because if you plant them on the north side, they'd be blocked out by your tomatoes coming into Mayor's, um, Mayor Jim. Once we get to fall, um, kind of flipping that. So wherever your okra or tomatoes or peppers or maybe some squash or something um, tall, having it on that south side and then looking at planting those radishes, lettuces, different plants on the north side. Now this isn't, you don't have to do this, but with how long our Missouri summers go, where we're sometimes it just doesn't seem like we have a fall. Um, these cool season plants really do like cool nights. And so giving them a little bit of extra shade can be really helpful. Um, and then by the time that sun is a limiting factor again, you're ripping out that tomato, pepper, you plant your okra anyways. Um, so your plant should be getting plenty of sunlight. We follow this technique quite a bit. So like, Right now we're planting some carrots on the north side of some tomatoes that are planted right down the middle of the bed. Um, okra is like, I mean, it basically looks like a tree once it, at the end of the season, it's a great shading plant. So when you think about like laying out your bed in general, um, 
And this is what we do is we really think about first those long-term big plants, what's gonna be in that bed for the entire year. Um, and so those ones, that's like kale, collards, tomatoes. Now they're not growing in the spring, but they're gonna be growing from pretty much after your, first, after your last frost date until the whole growing season. Same with eggplants, peppers, um, and then broccoli as well. They take quite a bit. So all those kind of figuring out where those things go first. Um, and then from there, start thinking about kind of days to maturity um, and then where to kind of stick in. I kind of always think of like, all right, the radishes, carrots, all those root crops, the lettuce, they all take a lot less space. So where am I gonna stick those in around those other plants? Um, so I like to do a lot of like, for planting like kale or collards in a bed, doing kind of like a, a, a border of onions um, that kind of gets in. I'll talk a little bit of um, some companion planting as well. Um, but they're also, they don't need a ton of space, so you kind of tuck them in there. Same with radishes, carrots, they don't need a lot of space. So kind of figuring out some other gaps in your planting, you can really optimize your growing space. And I mentioned a little bit earlier about the loose leaf lettuce. So, so yeah, look at that right after, it flows right in. Um, companion plants and herbs. Um, so with the research on companion planting, it is kind of mixed on like if it's actually that beneficial or not, but you might as well try it. Um, and a lot of this companion planting is also kind of paired culinarily as well, um, that you would kind of eat those things together anyways. Um, basil and tomatoes is a pretty common one thought of. Um, but I like to think of companion planting and herbs and growing them in the garden as kind of creating a diverse ecosystem um, and really bring in the integrated pest management techniques um, into that planting. Um, so having lots of different flowering plants um, can really help bring in lots of other pollinators and other insects as well that can then prey on some of the pests that are attacking your garden. Um, it also just makes it look a lot prettier, adds a lot of flavors and smells and just lots of great things. Um, so if you're thinking about adding, if you're wanting to add some other plants in, um, sage, I really love growing sage as a companion plant. You can kind of tuck it in in places. It's a perennial, so it'll keep coming back um, so sometimes you'll have to cut it back or divide it. Um, marigolds is like the most common one most people think of. Add some nice color as well. Um, of the research of companion plants, the ones that have been, that have shown to be somewhat effective, marigolds and then plants in the onion family. Um, so onions, garlic, um, chives, things like that. They have all shown some repelling of some smaller insects. So. I know, I think in the research you see like white flies and aphids as the ones that have shown some, um, some effect. And then milkweed, um, really, I mean, for the monarchs, but really planting milkweed is a beautiful plant. Um, nasturtiums are a great flowering edible as well. Um, you go into like any fancy restaurants, you'll see some flowers as well from that. Um, basil, rosemary, thyme, stuff like that. So I put some other combinations outside of just the regular basil and tomato, um, lettuce and broccoli, spinach and tomatoes, radishes and carrots pair really well together. Huh. Um, a little bit of trellising. Um, I, we love to grow things up stuff the Gateway Greening. It adds great space, but it also really adds a nice like vertical touch to your garden. Um, it is really beneficial for plants. It adds a lot more air and sunlight, um, which can keep a lot of pests down. Definitely a lot of mildews, which here in Missouri with our humid summers, um, mildew is a pretty big problem with a lot of like cucumbers and squash. Um, so getting a little bit more airflow in there can reduce the chance. Um, also, it's much more efficient to water because you don't actually have to hit the leaves and just hit the base of the plant. You can see where it is. I think it's a lot easier to harvest as well. I don't have to bend over. Um, it's a lot easier to tell for pests. Um, and again, it just looks really great. So. Um, we use a lot of cow panels, um, which you can buy like Rural King and different places. We actually sell them at our store on our website, um, but they're pretty cheap. They're very heavy duty, um, which is great. Um, and you can kind of shape them into different things. So we get them in 16 foot long panels. Sometimes we cut them down to eight feet for a bed. Sometimes we take the 16 foot and we kind of bend it like an arbor. Um, so you can kind of grow stuff and walk underneath it. Um, it's a really really inexpensive way to add some really cool designs to a garden. So a little bit about fall. So I was talking about kind of spacing to keep your plants cool. Um, 
really the heat at the end of the summer, I mean, it is pretty tough on planting cool season plants. So first, if you're going to be planting this fall, I always just tell people like, just be like, don't get discouraged. Um, it's pretty like, it's just tough sometimes definitely for like lettuces and radishes and turnips and beets for them to really take when it's still like 100 degrees outside. Um, but for ways to kind of prevent it, you want to try to keep the soil cool. Um, so shading is first one of the best ways to do that. You can use plants, so like this picture right here, um, some cucumbers growing on a cow panel, um, shading some lettuce. Um, also, you can then if you don't can't do that, you can actually buy some shade cloth. Um, there's a bunch of different shade numbers for cloths, so you'll see like 70, 75, 90. It all tells you how much sunlight gets in. I think we use a 70 usually. Um, um, that can really keeping that soil cool can really help the fall garden because it really helps the soil temperature at night. Um, and most plants that bolt or go to seed um, from heat, it's really the nighttime temperatures that do it. Um, so using shading is one great way. Um, you should also be mulching. So if any of you, if you plant any of these using like a leaf mulch, so like this bed should probably take some leaf mulch on there. And you can do about three, four inches. You can go pretty heavy with the leaf mulch. Um, it'll keep it cooler. It'll add like an insulation layer between the soil and the hot, temp, the hot air above it. Um, and then also water regularly. So if it's 100 degrees, you should probably water a couple, like twice a day. Um, if they're cool season plants, you should look at probably watering twice a day, even when it gets down to like 90 degrees or so. And then also watering in the late afternoon, once it starts to get, the sun goes, starting to go down, that is also a really good time to water to keep the plants cool. So a little bit about watering, I was just kind of, I like this picture, it looks really nice of what a plant without, like if it's dried out, it's not like it's actually dead. The plant is actually just protecting itself by reducing water from the cell walls. So one thing is with watering, and we're about to kind of move into the pest management, which is great because we've got about five minutes. So try to avoid watering on the leaves. It's really, it encourages mildews, definitely here in Missouri. I'll skip through. All right. So we're going to get to some basics of pest management. Um, so first, prevention, definitely with like everything, is key. So good plant spacing, um, proper watering techniques, having some healthy plants, so buying those ones if you're looking at, if you have problems with mildews or things. Um, hybrid varieties, you'll see them. Um, I know we'll go into lists of that. Healthy soil, so using mulch, composts, um, cover crops as well. Um, those all produce healthy soils, which then in turn creates healthy plants. Um, and healthy plants can fight off pests and diseases much easier. And then kind of specifically the crop selection. So like I mentioned earlier, a little bit about crop selection. Um, hybrids, heirlooms are finicky. We always grow a couple of heirlooms with our tomatoes, but then we also always do just grow some standard like Romas. Um, and then I always do just make the point, our wild weather, we do have, it's pretty tough here. We have like a summer storm just flow right, like come right through. It seems like it's already gone. Um, and then the high humidity really makes it tough on cucumbers and squash. So if you're kind of first new to gardening, start with those easy crops. Um, and a lot of these are, so like radishes, turnips, lettuce, those are all cool season crops. They're very easy to grow. Um, radishes, 30 days to maturity on some of those. Um, so it's really quick and easy to see. Herbs, chives and sage, I mean, those things will just, you can cut chives, you cut chives back four or five times a year and you just keep getting them. Um, okra, very easy to grow here. Um, tomatoes and peppers, um, they're a lot tougher, but so if you're starting this, like if you're starting as a new gardener, mixing in some easy crops with some tougher ones is a great way to go. So for pest management, crop rotations. Um, if you can do a crop rotation, you should do a crop rotation. Um, so for crop rotations, basically rotating your crops every season. Um, now, if you only have one raised bed, you really can't do a crop rotation. Um, it is, you can rotate the plants, the crops in the same bed. You'll get a little bit of benefit, but not really any. Um, for nutrients, you'll get some benefit, but for pests, you won't get any benefit. Um, so the benefits with a crop rotation are, um, so how these kind of plants are categorized, not all plants 
take the same nutrients up. Um, so rotating crops between different soils um, means that they're draining different nutrients at different levels. Um, it also is a way to prevent pests. Um, so an ideal crop rotation is every four years. That's not really possible um, because what that means is a quarter of your bed, a quarter of your beds have to be planted within this kind of crop rotation. We don't do that at Gateway Greening because nobody wants a quarter of our beds to be planted with beans and peas. Um, people want tomatoes, cucumbers, they want cabbage, they want collards, they want kales, they want things like that. So um, we try to do our best. Whenever I'm like talking about crop rotation, telling people what to do, um, your fruiting plants, so your tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, eggplants, peppers, those ones are the most susceptible to pests. So those are the ones you should look at trying to do every four years. If you can't do every four years, try every three. If you can't do every three, try every two. Try to implement it any way you possibly can. Um, because a lot of these have soil-borne pests. So if you plant tomatoes in a bed, in the same bed every year, maybe for the first couple of years, you'll be fine. But you may start to see tomato blight show up. Um, and tomato blight is probably one of the most common soil-borne diseases out there. Um, and the way to get rid of it is either get rid of all your soil or rotate your crops so you don't have tomatoes in there for a couple of years. Um, so if you are looking at doing a rotation, you can, but maybe you can't do every four years or you just really love your fruiting plants like most people. Um, look to try to at least rotate your fruiting plants every couple of years. So a little bit about disease codes. Um, in general. Um, so whenever you're looking at different plants or seeds, um, and you're trying to figure out if you're, want, you're growing one that's really disease resistant, these are some pretty basic disease codes that you should look out for. Um, and so this means they do have some resistance to it. So whenever we're looking for squashes, cucumbers or squash, um, downy mildew or powdery mildew, those two um, are the ones that affect those squash and Cucumbers the most, um, you'll see it quite often here. Pretty much right around this time, you'll start to see um, some kind of like, almost looks like a white powder on the leaves of squash and cucumber plants. Those are mildews. Um, it's pretty hard to prevent them. Um, you can spray some things, some fungicides, but in general with just how humid it is, there's really not a way to stop it. So you wanna try to find plants that have some resistance. Doesn't mean that they're not gonna get it, but it means they can survive usually or grow through it. Um, with cucumbers, and really with cucumbers and summer squashes, um, if you're in an area that seems to always get mildews or other kind of pests, I always tell people just to expect to plant a second planting of them. Um, plant your first set of cucumbers and squash and really and right after frost, right after the last frost date. Expect them to eventually die in the summer. So what you should do is then in your garden, plant another set a succession in another area as far away as possible from those plants. Um, so then that'll guarantee that you'll have another set growing of cucumbers or squash and you can basically have those throughout the season. So. Some other ones like tobacco mosaic virus. So this one affects toma uh, tomatoes specifically because tomato and tobacco are related. Um, and then some other wilts that affect fruiting plants as well. Some things about pests first, there will be pests. Um, plants don't need to look perfect to grow um, and a small amount of pests are just fine. Um, so this is all kind of organic pest management, um, but we're gonna cover a couple big ones for here. Aphids and spider mites, I throw these together. Um, they're soft body bugs, they'll eat through the leaves and you'll see them a lot of times on um, cabbages, kale. Um, I mean, they really will be on everything. Um, eggplant, I find eggplant, Every single year, right when we get sets of seedlings of eggplant, there's always um, spider mites on it. And you'll see the leaves start to kind of get holes in it and then they look like they're gonna to start to dry out. Um, the thing with aphids and spider mites is they reproduce very quickly, but they're really easy to kill. Um, because of their soft body, um, neem oil or a diatomaceous earth can kill them pretty much like, like pretty quickly. Um, Really with any of these pest management techniques though, with any sprays or things like that, you should do, it's always recommended to do a couple days, like do three days at least in a row of using it. 
So like neem oil, if you have some spider mites on your eggplant, um, you mix up the neem oil and do it every three days. Do it like for three days in a row. Um, it's the same kind of idea as with like taking uh, antibiotics where if you were to just do it once, um, you'd kill most of them, but then they reproduce so quickly that they're gonna come back. So you wanna try to get rid of all of them at once. So kind of keep doing it in um, at least three days um, and they'll come back too. So like we're spraying again this already this fall uh, for some of these because they've started to show back up again. So squash bugs. Um, so this one's, squash bugs are very common. Uh, we see them a lot. They attack things other than just squash too, but you'll see them a lot on squash plants. You'll see them on some brassicas as well. Um, you'll notice neem oil used a lot. I like using neem oil because it's non-toxic. It's very easy to use. Um, and it works as pretty much a general pesticide. Uh, for their eggs, you'll see the eggs that look like this. Um, the neem oil pretty much will kill the eggs if you get enough on it in direct contact. The thing is they lay their eggs on the bottom, the backside of leaves. So you have to kind of look, um, so you have to lift open squash plants. Um, for the adults, pretty much picking them is the best way to get rid of them for organic sprays. There are some other organic sprays that are a little bit more toxic that do, do affect them a little bit, but I find really just picking them early in the season and just getting them out that way. If you don't want to smash them in your hand, you can always drop them in a cup of soapy water um, and that'll kill them. Squash vine borer. So this is pretty common here. Um, our Bell Community Garden um, and Demo Garden, we have squash vine borers every single year. Um, it's an egg laid by a moth um, that they lay them at the base of squash plants. Um, and then the grub, basically it hatches and the grub eats its way through the stem of the plant. This picture's perfect, it shows the actual grub right there. If you kind of look in really here, there's kind of this like brownish orange, kind of looks kind of like wood shavings almost. Um, if you see that next to holes at the base of your squash plants, that means you have it. Um, so they say it's hatched and that's how it dug in and that's what it's eaten. Um, to prevent these, the best way is just to cover the plants. Um, so usually in, we, the moths are laying their eggs around early May to late May is usually the time we have. Um, with our summers getting a little bit longer and coming earlier, that timing is a little bit off now, but that's usually the time. So what we do is if we're planting summer squash or winter squash, um, by seed we plant it and then we cover it with a row cover. Um, and that row cover we keep on until we see flowers come up. So once the plant starts to flower, we need to let in, you know, bees to pollinate. Um, so we lift it up and we let it go. Um, with summer squash, um, I mean, well, with winter squash or summer squash, you could actually pollinate it yourself if you're really worried. Um, but that usually gets us through most of the season. Um, the one thing is, and I always mention this, is um, just south of us in Arkansas, they actually have the squash vine borer. They have two generations of it. So their summers are long enough to where they get two generations of it. So you'll see it early in May, and then you'll actually see it again in August. Um, I haven't seen that yet here, but the longer our summers get, it's most likely we're gonna have two generations. So then this technique of covering until you see flowers really won't work as well. Um, definitely for winter squash, because you need to grow the whole season. For summer squash, you can let it grow, and. It'll die eventually, but you'll still get some zucchini and summer squash out of it. Um, but for that, it is one of those where the best way then after that is to grow varieties of plants that they don't like. Uh, so you'll see butternut squash. They do affect butternut squash, but you'll see it a lot less. Um, and then we do grow two different varieties. We actually sell the seeds because we hear it so much that people have basically kind of stopped growing some winter squash and summer squash varieties. Um, so we grow, it's called a trombancino squash. Um, and then we also grow um, seminal pumpkins. Um, so both of those, they aren't really resistant to the vine borer, but the vine borer just doesn't like them. So I've never seen, we've grown them side by side with other, like literally next to each other, uh, next to other plants that then get killed by the vine borer and they're just fine. Um, so for some reason they don't like it. 
tomato hornworms. Um, so if you ever see your tomato plants with leaves eaten out like this, you probably have a hornworm. Sometimes it might be the wind, but most likely it's a hornworm. Um, they can start very small. They can start like that little, but they'll just keep growing. Um, and they just, they look like this. They're very, really weird looking and kind of gross. Um, really the best way to get rid of them is while you're pruning your tomatoes, just look for them. Um, they're one of those that it's impossible, like they feel like they're impossible to find until you do see one and then it's like you see them all. Um, you will sometimes see a parasitic wasp, like you'll see them look like this. So this is how it looks normally, but sometimes you'll see like almost looking like feathers on the back of them. Those are eggs that have been laid on them by a parasitic wasp. So if you do see that, um, it's best to just leave it um, because those eggs will hatch, they'll kill that hornworm, and then you're actually, you're gonna have a lot more wasps in that area that attack those hornworms. So it's a little like added in pest management technique. So mildews, so like I was saying, they're very common here due to high humidity. Um, this squash plant is a good picture of some mildew on it. Um, one good way to prevent this first, don't water the leaves of plants. So limiting the amount of water that hits them. Um, if you start to see it, to get, if you start to see like little spots, um, when it's this much, it's almost, it's pretty much too far gone. Um, but when you start to see little spots, spraying with a fungicide. Um, neem oil is also a fungicide as well. Um, so spraying with that will help. The one thing with any of these oil-based, so neem oil and some other fungicides are oil-based, um, is if it's too hot outside, so if it's about 95 degrees or hotter, um, which during middle of summer, Missouri, we do get that. Um, you shouldn't be spraying these on leaves. Um, it's an oil, so it'll actually burn the leaves of the plant um, from the sunlight. So spray either below that temperature or actually just wait for it to be a cloudy day to spray or spray late afternoon. So viruses. Um, so there's lots and lots of viruses. Like I was saying, a tomato, uh, tobacco mosaic virus is a pretty common one in tomatoes. Um, they're very, they're pretty tough to diagnose and prevent. Um, a lot of times they're spread by pests. Um, so you'll have a pest that has it and it eats a leaf off of one plant and eats it off another and that's the vector it spreads. Um, healthy plants can survive a lot of these infections. Um, so, but really when you're looking for those healthy plants, like I was mentioning, um, soil, proper planting things at the proper time, but also buying seeds that have virus resistance is usually the best way. Um, once they get it, there really isn't ways to prevent viruses, um, but those healthy plants can usually at least beat it enough to produce plant, produce fruit. Um, there really aren't any viruses where if the leaves are starting to look like this, um, the fruit is still finding it. Um, so I do, we get that question quite a bit. Um, sometimes you'll see eggplants start to yellow when the plant is stressed. Technically it's still healthy to eat, I don't really like to eat it because it looks kind of weird and gross, but it is still pretty fun to eat. So a little bit of, like I was mentioning, those were the pests. So this is neem oil. Um, this is a garden safe one. Um, one thing is avoid spraying it on flowers. This is a leaf based one. So you, this one, neem oil is direct contact. Um, so for those soft body in insects like aphids and spider mites, um, it being directly on them is what will kill them. Um, it does have a little bit, like it does mess with some insects' um, nervous systems, um, and specifically bees, so it can disrupt pollination. So really don't spray it on flowers. You really shouldn't be spraying it on flowers anyways. Um, they're really like, most of the plants that you're spraying, up, spraying neem oil on don't really flower, or if they do, um, the leaves aren't near the flowers. BT, um, so if you do have, um, and we always get this on our cabbages specifically, um, but if you get some caterpillars on your cabbages, um, BT is, um, it is specifically designed to kill caterpillars. It only works on caterpillars. Um, it's made from the bacteria Bacillus thuringiens, um, and it basically produces, you spray, it's a direct contact, so you spray it on the leaf. Um, the caterpillar eats the leaf, and then it causes the caterpillar's stomach to rupture, um, which is a pretty gruesome way to die for the caterpillar, but it's really nice because it's non-toxic. 
or any other pests. Like so, you don't really have to worry about as much pollinators yourself. It's a very specific um, pesticide, which you don't get a lot within organic pest pesticides. So that's very nice. Diatomaceous earth. Um, so basically, these are just tiny rocks. Um, they're really, um, really, if you're using it, just make sure you don't breathe it in because um, they're tiny rocks that can damage your lungs. Um, but they cut up soft body insects. Um, rain and water will remove it. So if it rains, right after, don't put this on right after, right before it rains. But this also is nice because you can be pretty aggressive with using it. Um, and then if you like harvesting, if you're doing this on, say, um, some kale or maybe some squash, like summer squash, and you get it some maybe on your like zucchini, you can just rinse it off and it's fine. So. Kale and clay, um, also seen as surround, that's the brand name. Um, this one, I always put this in there because some people just like, we don't really have any slug problems at a lot of the gardens we use because there's pretty good drainage. But if you do have slug problems, um, kale and clay is a great, it's like, it's the thing to use to get rid of slugs. Um, you, this is a nice little demonstration of what farms do with it, where they dunk um, small plants in it, but you also use it similar to diatomaceous to earth. You just put it on the leaves. Um, it also does slow down egg laying and feeding for a lot of plant, for a lot of pests. Um, I find it is like, it works against like flea beetles, mites, thrips, and aphids. I don't find it as effective as others, but for slugs, it works really well. Also rain washes it away too. And then like a little bit insecticidal soap, I didn't really mention this earlier with those, but it also works on small soft body insects too. So. All right, um, we are, yeah, definitely past the time. So um, if anybody has any questions, um, we can, take them and if you can just type them in if you want to the chat. Um, you can also email us, um, I think at the end. Yeah, so these are some resource links. We'll send this out um, to everybody that signed up. Um, I like some other just like good information websites like K-State's Horticulture webs um, has a weekly email that's really great. Cornell has a really good home gardening section. Um, these hours of operation are not accurate go to our website for more accurate hours of operation. Um, and then high mowing seeds is, yeah, a place I really like to buy seeds from. So. If you have any questions, you can ask now in the chat or you can email um, and I can answer them over email. So, all right, thank you. And while we're just waiting for